Diabetes rates in Singapore nearly double with each age group, reaching about one in five among those aged 60 to 74. That's from the National Population Health Survey. Nadine Young breaks down the types of diabetes and how they affect the body. Singaporeans, we love our food. Sweet, savoury, spicy, places like these have got it all. Bubble tea, kopi peng, nasi goreng, prata, we're always spoiled for choice. But here's something that we don't always think about. Food is very much an integral part of our Singapore culture, especially local food. There, there are always a variety of options and if you like certain food, perhaps less, have it less frequently and have it in smaller portions um, and still enjoy your food. What happens when all that sugar we eat can't get into our cells properly? That's what diabetes is all about and it's become one of the biggest health issues in Singapore today. Did you know? One in three Singaporeans could develop diabetes in their lifetime. That's not just a number. That could be a friend, a family, your colleague, maybe even you. So here's what's really happening when we dig into a plate of something like this. It gives us that instant energy rush, but it also floods our blood with sugar that needs to be managed. When we eat, our body breaks food down into glucose or sugar that gives us energy. To move that sugar from our blood into our cells, we need insulin, a hormone made by the pancreas. You can think of insulin as a key that unlocks the doors of our cells, letting sugar in so it can be used for energy. But if there's no key or if the lock doesn't work, sugar gets stuck outside, building up in our bloodstreams. That's diabetes. And over time, that extra sugar can damage blood vessels, nerves and organs, especially our heart, kidney and eyes. There are two main types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2, and they tell very different stories. Remember that insulin is like a key that unlocks the cell doors. They can look the same on the outside, but what's happening inside is very different. Type 1 usually begins young, when the body stops making insulin altogether. No insulin means sugar can't get into his cells, so he feels thirsty, tired and loses weight fast. His body has no keys to unlock the cells. In type 2, the keys are there, but the locks have grown rusty. This woman's cells resist the insulin and sugar stays in the blood. Different causes, same result. High blood sugar and the same warning signs. So what's really going on inside? In type 1 diabetes, the immune system mistakenly destroys the pancreas cells that make insulin. They are the keys that let sugar into our cells. Without insulin, blood sugar builds up. So people with type 1 need daily insulin through injections or a pump. It usually starts when you're young and it's not caused by diet or exercise. It just happens. Type 2 diabetes is much more common. Here, the body still makes insulin, but the cells stop responding properly. That's called insulin resistance. At first, the body makes more insulin to cope, but over time, it can't keep up and sugar stays in the blood. Type 2 is also far more common. Over 90% of diabetes cases in Singapore, and it's often linked to things we can change. What we eat, how active we are, and our weight. But family history plays a part too, so it's not all about willpower. Singapore has one of the highest diabetes rates in the world. More than 400,000 people here are living with diabetes, and that number is still climbing. What's worrying is that we're seeing it appear in younger adults, even people in their 30s. That's why the government launched the War on Diabetes. It's not just a slogan, it's a reminder that our daily habits matter. Because small choices every day can make a huge difference to our future health. So what if you're feeling perfectly fine? Should you still get tested? And what about children? Can they get type 1? And many people who live with diabetes may not be aware that they have this condition. And very often they only present when the glucose levels go very high or they present with the diabetes-related complications. And that would include heart attacks, uh, strokes, or blindness or kidney failure. And in those situations, it is perhaps a little bit too late. The good news, type 2 diabetes can often be prevented or delayed. Choose water instead of sugary drinks. 
take the stairs. Go for a walk after your dinner, and most importantly, go for your regular health checkups, especially if you're over 40. Can type 2 diabetes really be reversed? Having a structured meal plan where you could split, split your calorie intake into thrice daily with minimizing of anything in between would really help with the glucose levels. And then you have to then do some glucose monitoring monitoring in order to see whether you're headed in the right way. They might sound small, but those small steps add up. And if you already have diabetes, it doesn't mean life stops. With the right treatment, healthy food and regular checkups, you can live a full active life. Around the world, millions of people are living with diabetes, but the story doesn't have to stay the same. Early screening, small lifestyle changes and a little awareness can make a big difference. So the next time you're tempted by an extra sweet drink, remember, balance is everything. And for more on Singapore's fight against diabetes, we're joined by Associate Professor B. Yong Mong, who is President of Diabetes Singapore. He's also the Head and Senior Consultant at the Department of Endocrinology at the Singapore General Hospital. Prof. B, welcome to the studio. Yeah, good evening. Now let's start with which groups of people are most at risk for diabetes? And have you seen the profile of this group change uh, mm. between type 1 and type 2? Yep. As mentioned in the earlier bulletin, I think there are two main types of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, which tend to be diagnosed in children and young adults, we, did not, we do not see any change in the trend of type 1 diabetes. But in terms of type 2 diabetes, which account for almost 98 to 99 percent of our diabetes population, we are diagnosing diabetes in younger adults, including adolescents and those in the 20s. So this is something of concern. Uh, having diabetes diagnosed at such a young age. Mm. What is the cause behind this? Why yes. is the type 2 diabetes rate, especially among young people, rising? So uh, the, one of the strongest risk factors is that of obesity. So a lot of these young adults with diagnosed with diabetes tends to be overweight or obese. They tend to have sedentary lifestyles. They may or may not have a family history of diabetes, but the common underlying denominator is their body weight being overweight or being obese. Mm, and that's quite a worrying uh, trend. And an another worrying trend has been discovered is that recent surveys found that 40% of respondents in Singapore have pre-diabetes. Mm. How concerned are you about this? And are we catching these cases early enough? So pre-diabetes um, uh, is a condition whereby the blood glucose is just slightly elevated but has not reached the level to fulfill the diabetes criteria. This is concerning because this group of individuals with pre-diabetes has a very high risk of progressing to develop diabetes in the subsequent years. So I think it's important to pick them up early. Unfortunately, individuals with pre-diabetes will not have symptoms. Mm. So it's important for um, uh, every citizen to go for screening from the age of 40 and above to, dis to discover whether they have pre-diabetes or you have diabetes and you can intervene early at such early stages. Yeah, now we mentioned earlier also that, you know, Singaporeans are becoming diabetic at a younger yes. age. We mentioned, you mentioned the reasons for this are, you know, lifestyle yeah. related most of the time. Mm -hmm. Why is this a, a significant concern, especially if you consider that this is very early on yes. in their lives? Imagine someone with diabetes at the age of 40 versus someone with diabetes at the age of 70. The first person with diabetes diagnosed at age of 40 will have a low exposure to high sugar level in the body and they are at high risk of developing complications many years down the road. So this also translates to higher lifetime healthcare costs mm -hmm. as well as potentially the loss in productivity and the impact on their career at that young age. Mm. Now, we know that Singapore has launched the war on diabetes about nine years ago. Mm -hmm. So one decade on, mm -hmm. how do you evaluate the, the consequence and the result mm. of this battle? What have we done yes. right? And also, what are some gaps that you've noticed we need yeah. to address? If you look at the overall picture, I think the general awareness of diabetes has gone up significantly through the various policy initiatives uh, from the uh, governmental level or from the community's level. So that is very apparent. I think the second big thing is the availability of more healthier food options in our food centre. You can uh, uh, get brown rice or whole grain meals in our centres. And the introduction of the new tree grade grading is also, has also been helpful to nudge Singaporeans to reduce the sugar consumption. So these are some of the um, uh, visible sort of improvement following the launch of the war on diabetes. But there are still gaps. I think we talk about health screening. So a lot of our young adults 
despite the heavy governmental subsidies through the Healthy SG screening program, are not going for the screening. Hence, we may be picking them up much later in the disease journey versus getting them, picking them up early at the pre-diabetes stage, whereby it can be reversed through intensive lifestyle modifications. Yeah, and speaking of lifestyle modifications, can you recommend or give some tips to our viewers now mm. who are thinking, okay, I might have pre-diabetes, I need to get screened, yes. but also are there changes that I can make to my lifestyle apart yes. from the dietary changes yes. that you've mentioned earlier? Yeah. Uh, what are small steps we can yeah. take? If you talk about pre-diabetes, to reverse the pre-diabetes, one of the key target you need to achieve is to lose maybe about 3 to 7% of your body weight. So how do you achieve that to reverse the pre-diabetes? I think a balanced diet is very important. Yeah. Uh, reduce the consumption of added sugar, more whole grains, uh, uh, adequate fiber content, adequate protein content. The second thing is adequate exercise. The general recommendation is 150 minutes of mild to moderate physical activities. I think brisk walking mm. is a very easy exercise to adopt. I think the third thing is to go for regular screening to know whether your condition has improved or has deteriorated. Yeah, so regular screening, again, would yes. be very key to detecting it as early as possible, yeah. make the lifestyle changes, yes. and then you prevent a long-term exactly. struggle with the disease. Now, before we go very quickly, if you can maybe give some recommendations mm. for viewers who are used to having maybe a high-sugar diet mm -hmm. and they might find it hard to make adjustments, what are some swaps or some dietary swaps that we can mm. make? Mm. Let's say from the daily hawker food that might be a bit yes. more unhealthy or fast food, mm. for example. Yes. How would you make that swap? Any recommendations? I often tell my patients, uh, if you tend to eat out all three meals a day, cut back by one meal a day first, maybe for breakfast. Eat something healthy at home before you go to work. I think a lot of Singaporeans spend their breakfast at hawker centres. I think that may be a first key change to eat healthy food, at least for the start of the day. All right, thank you so much for your recommendations and your insights today, uh, Prof B. We have Associate Professor B. Yong Mong here with us today. He's President of Diabetes Singapore and also the Head and Senior Consultant of Endocrinology at SGH.